Welcome to Inside Scoop with Sean Emery, where we will continuously bring you closer to companies, sectors, and themes. This recording should not be construed in any manner whatsoever as a substitute for personalized individual advice from Avery and Company. Information presented is for educational purposes only and does not intend to make an offer or solicitation for the sale or purchase of any specific securities, investments, or investment strategies mentioned. Investments involve risk and unless otherwise stated, are not guaranteed. Hello, everyone. We have another digital note here on Inside Scoop. Today, I had the opportunity to speak with David Pierce. He's currently the head of data visualization at Expedia Group. They own Expedia, VRBO, which is the competitor to Airbnb, Hotels.com, Trivago, HomeAway, Orbitz, Hotwire, and, and many other brands. Uh, you can just imagine the amount of data that is being ingested there to turn that into visuals. Uh, he's also on the board of Viz for Social Good, which assists mission-driven organizations to better harness the power of data and visualization. So it's a pretty cool organization he's part of there, and he talks a little bit about that in the segment. Uh, but this conversation today is around data, the use of data, and turning that data into visuals. Uh, we've seen the infrastructure layer for the cloud mature somewhat over the last three years with Amazon, Microsoft, Google really running away with this segment. Uh, we've also seen the application layer somewhat mature. Salesforce captured CRM, ServiceNow is leading in IT operations. Adobe has entrenched themselves in creative, Workday and HR, and the list really goes on. But don't get me wrong, in that segment, there's still a lot to be done in the application layer and all of the innovation and, and ingenuity that can take place there. But now we have everything in between. So this comes to the data layer, which then comes to Snowflake. And as Snowflake IPOs, we wanted to get a sense of data warehouse, data lakes, and the environment that's uh, taking place there competitively. And Snowflake complete, competes with Amazon Redshift, Google BigQuery, Oracle, and the likes of many other incumbents and even new players. And don't forget just how big this space is. Oracle is the perceived dinosaur, but this dinosaur is generating $40 billion in revenue. So what we know is the opportunity is huge. And the opportunity is also very mission critical to these organizations as data is everything. Um, so during my conversation, I think you'll get a good sense of how important this segment can be, not only for investors, but improve outcomes as data goes from data silos. So think my Excel sheet and your Excel sheet to a more integrated and more flexible like Airtable, like experience. And if you don't know what Airtable is, just think of it basically as a Google Sheets on steroids. Um, so with that, Let's get to the conversation with David. I hope you enjoy. David, how you doing? Thanks for coming on Inside Scoop. Hello, thank you very much for having me. Yeah, so you're in, in London. How's everything over there? Are you guys getting back to any form of kind of normal behavior? I think we are slowly. Uh, there's always the risk of kind of the, the second spike as we, we go into the fall. I think there's a, some questions in the air as school reopens. So fingers crossed everything goes smoothly. Yeah, good. Yeah, over here, it's, things are getting back to some form of normal. Obviously, we have a, a, a big test uh, with, with flu season on the horizon uh, and, and cold weather on the horizon in the north. Um, so we will see how that plays out. And obviously cross our fingers with uh, all the, the data and science that's taking place in the world and, and technology. And, and uh, hopefully 2021 is uh, we can start it off on, on a good foot. Um, so I was happy to get you on here uh, for uh, kind of share about yourself, share about the, the thoughts of, of what's going on in data and visualization. Y you could also share us how, how you became the head of, of data and visualization at Expedia Group. You oversee a lot of stuff. Uh, there's a lot of companies underneath that um, umbrella. Um, but, but just tell us a little about yourself, how, how you became uh, and, and how you got to where you are today. Oh, thank you. Uh, as I said, thank you very much for, uh, for inviting me. Um, so kind of how I ended up here is kind of a mix of um, luck and kind of, I guess, being in the right, right space and kind of being interested in kind of continuing to develop. So I used to work in the mortgage space for banking many, many years ago. And then in 2008, as you expect, financial crash hit, which meant that there was a change of direction that was needed. So I looked at analytics and it felt like the right space to go into. And from there, I uh, 
going to somewhat continue to work in benchmarking and, and banking, retail banking specifically, here in the UK, working in various uh, roles on the analytics space, and then kind of grew from there and joined um, consultancy into workspace out in Oklahoma. And they and there the, the key was really to kind of help other businesses with their analytical problems and be able to to support them with uh, with analytics at scale. Then fast forward a little bit and I joined Expedia about a year ago um, to head up the, the, visualization, the visualization team there where we are kind of creating some interesting products internally to help us uh, kind of shine the light on, on key insights. Yeah, no, thanks for that. Um, and just to be clear, this is, this is your own personal conversation. This has nothing to do with Expedia um, in terms of his views. But uh, important time, obviously, you see some of the data in travel. Um, mm -hmm. You also uh, were at a moment in time where uh, the speed of having access to data is, is critical. We're also at the time where, where Snowflake um, is uh, the number one hyped IPO of the year. Uh, whether we agree or not, or disagree on, on that, um, it, it's really just trying to think about what's the value add there. So, so again, you turn data into visualizations and the back end of that is, is really critical in having access to that. You, you probably have one of the uh, most looked at Tableau reports over the last month uh, where you take in Apple mobility, Google mobility data, I think data from like Oxford and, and, and maybe another data source. So you have four pools of data that you had to aggregate together. Uh, not an easy thing to do 10 years ago, probably easier five years ago. Uh, Snowflake is, and, and some of the other competitors, whether it's uh, Redshift from AWS or, or um, BigQuery from, from Google, uh, just talk about the data layer of like what's going on there that's making your life, let's say, easier, uh, and just maybe the how you view uh, those competitors, uh, what you potentially like, what you you dislike, uh, okay. any favorites in that space, and then we'll get to the uh, the BI tools. Yeah, I, I think um, just on your point about the importance of data, I think it, it, it's key. Um, Maybe some some time ago we would try and find some examples where I think the easiest one is to look back uh, to March this year, where anywhere we would look, people were trying to get their hands on data that would be able that would allow to them to understand the number of cases in an area, what were the the spikes in the previous number of uh, of days, um, and then. For instance, in our case, uh, the example that you given from Expedia, which you shared on on Medium. Uh, we utilize the data from those uh, from those sources, and we pulled everything combined with internal data to be able to kind of surface some some internal views to be able to track where um, restrictions were, which meant that customers couldn't travel or where mobility was happening. So, for those that are listening, in terms of what we talk about, mobility is looking at a baseline. So, how many, how much traffic is happening in one specific area, or if people are walking to the shops and things like that, and be able to to get a view on those. Um, and I think that was, it's fascinating to see, for instance, conversations we saw on Twitter as well, where people were waiting for the Financial Times and John Byrne more doc to release the new stats every single day, right? So because they wanted to, the everyone's trying to get get a handle on data. Um, and I think that's, that's gonna be key for any business. I, I've said back in March that I think Q, um, the second half of this year, and I think the next year particularly, it's going to be key for analytics in general, because for the majority of the work that we had carried out, when I say we as anyone that's working in analytics, everything has to be redone because of the changes that happened this year, right? Anything that you did versus last year go, goes out the window. Any uh, machine learning models, they are running on, on, those, on that data needs to be redone. So I think that's interesting kind of to, to look at those spaces. If we talk about tools in particularly, I think I'm, I think I'm as excited as, uh, as everyone else about Snowflake IPO. A um, little bit of an anecdote. So back um, at, at Interworks, we had um, some, some, some of our leaders talk about this new thing that was going to come up. And this was about three years ago. Uh, and there was a room of engineers and consultants in the, in the BI side. Um, and they told us a little bit about what Snowflake was and what Snowflake could do. So the ability of uh, 
changing the size of the warehouse and the, the speed of querying based on the input of the query. So as data is coming in and you need more uh, capacity that you can open the flood, more uh, capacity for the data to pipe in, and then you're able to analyze it quicker. And the room was like everyone just wanted to be able to play it and play with it and kind of understand what it was doing. So when you have technology that excites that many people like so quickly, uh, it's interesting. So I'll be excited to see what Snowflake does. I think there's there's some interesting things on the back end side. You no know, Redshift has been there um, for a while, but I feel like for, for some of the those tools, for instance, where shift, I feel like they are playing a little bit catch up. And that's the same thing for other giants like Oracle and so on. I feel that they may be playing catch up um, a little bit like Uber and some of the others. So Uber was kind of the, the one that moved the market. And I feel like Snowflake has the capability to do that as well. Yeah, no, that makes sense. I think one aspect too that um, is pretty well known is, is just their ability to, to lay on top of uh, all the, the, the three major clouds, uh, AWS, Google, um, and Microsoft. Uh, how important is that, let's say, to a large organization um, to be able to have that flexibility um, when you potentially need it, let's say, at any point in time? Yeah, I think I think that's that's one of the key aspects, right? So if you're talking about like a large large enterprise, you want to be able to one have um, the flexibility. You want to make sure that you're not tied in just to, in one solution because um, you have multiple use cases, either internal, external, um, security, privacy. All of those things create. Uh, restrictions and ways that you need to kind of navigate, which means that having the ability of selecting whatever uh, main cloud vendor um, to sit on top of, uh, so for Snowflake to sit on top, I think that's going to be key. And for instance, AWS is uh, something that's been used quite in the past. I think Amazon themselves are using uh, Snowflake. So it'll be interesting to see what kind of partnerships will come out of it as well. Yeah. And then also the, the, the marketplace um, and the ability to share data, right? I'm, I'm thinking about uh, specifically your, um, your, your chart, right? Your, your dashboard that you built uh, during this time. And if all four or five of those data, uh, let's say pools, um, were using uh, the same uh, data vendor uh, uh, and, and, and maintaining it there and, and being able to stream all that data in, in that one central, let's say, uh, BI dashboard consistently, um, if everyone was using that same layer, how, how much easier would that have been to put that together? Uh, it sounds like yeah. a pretty decent use case. Yeah, I, I think I think you hit the nail on the head there. It's a, I think that's always the, the crux of data uh, is you can get access to some of it, but then there's a level of transformation that is required. So I think your point is, uh, is interesting is uh, what if organizations like um, Google for their mobility or Apple for their mobility or even Oxford University uh, worked with vendors to say, well, instead of you pushing out a CSV that people have to scrape uh, and then pull in, why don't you just provide a pipeline from one of the cloud um, one of the cloud vendors and that is the and the way that most of us can access data using an API call, for instance. I think that will make a lot of organizations' lives a lot easier, but I'm not sure if there's the appetite there yet. Right. It almost feels like Excel, right? Like you have to have Excel to send someone an Excel spreadsheet, um, <laughs> at least like 10 years ago. And, and uh, obviously there's new, new cooler tools now. And, um, but still Excel still is the, <laughs> is still yeah. the primary. Um, and, and it's whether this can be that Excel layer in a sense, um, but uh, in, in data storage and, and whatnot. Now, let's go one step higher, right? So, so we, we're really thinking through kind of the, the data layer and how um, interesting um, having this continuous access of, of data across uh, multiple clouds um, and outside of some of the technical stuff. But the, the, the next layer where, where you really specialize as well is, is uh, visualization. So there's so many tools out there. Um, Tableau is the 500 pound gorilla at this point, um, mm -hmm. gobbled up by Salesforce about a year ago. Um, then you have ThoughtSpot, which is kind of its own thing, Alteryx. You have uh, um, uh, Google made their acquisition uh, recently or, or about a year ago as well. 
Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, and again, you have all these different vendors. Um, so, so a couple things there is one is how do you see the law of the land in terms of, uh, BI tools, um, kind of what separates, let's say Tableau from the rest. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then also what's, what's changed at Tableau since the acquisition? Have, have you seen anything uh, different at all? Yeah, uh, I think I think that's a couple of things that we can talk about there. So in terms of the tools, uh, and you mentioned an interesting point, which is you touch on Alteryx, which has some integration with some visualization. But if you park that kind of on the side, because that sits more on the data transformation and ETL side. But I think from a visualization perspective, um, I think Tableau is, I think the analogy, analogy that I've seen, and I can't can subscribe to that is um, Tableau is your Cadillac, right? It mm-hmm. is expensive, looks amazing, super flexible, and there's a lot of things you can do with it. It's like Tesla the tools. Days, that has to be the new analogy. Tesla is the new analogy, I guess. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then you have... Um, and then you have other tools, for instance, I think Power BI is a good example, which um, you can use. So I guess the goal there is, if you're trying to create a report that it's going to be... Um, churned out every month doesn't re- require a lot of uh, creative or um, you're not looking to create some visualization that requires a lot of customization, then it does the job. It's there and it's available. However, um, and you probably would see this from within the Tableau community, if you want to stretch in terms of what visualization can look like uh, and how to convey data in a different way and how do you essentially utilize the blank canvas to create shapes and use trigonometry and use maybe some more advanced features to create some really compelling pieces, then I think Tableau would be, would be the tool to go. Uh, and my, that would be my preference as well. So the team that um, I have uh, within Expedia, it's amazing to see the things that they create and the ability that they have to manipulate the tool and be able to kind of be really creative in the way that they uh, display and visualize data. Hmm. And, and- and going back to Snowflake now, what, uh, the, there's always been a thought, specifically over the last like, 12 months, is uh, having a visualization tool on top of this uh, that's native. Um, they've, they've, they made an acquisition, and, and um, uh, they're starting to build at least some very preliminary visualization tools, mm-hmm. and just so you can quickly see things, and then you, you, you maybe move it into a more robust uh, product. Um, does that make sense to you? Uh, d- does it make sense that in, in five, 10 years from now that 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 will be native or do you think the open uh, ecosystem of, of bi tools to, to live again on top of that now um is is maybe the better route uh, as someone that is a user no i i think maybe they'll prove me wrong but i think they will probably won't put a tool uh, won't put a visualization tool on top i don't think it makes a lot of sense because essentially you're shifting you're splitting your technology into two and then it becomes a little bit harder to focus where on where you're actually really really good at um i think it's also good from their perspective that they have been integrating with a lot of visualizations also i've mentioned power bi and, uh, and snowflake for instance uh, and tableau in the case of tableau you can now write back to to snowflake so that integration is seamless now so you could be querying snowflake making some changes and then write back again to snowflake which is kind of a game changer to allow you to to create that so i think i i think they will probably continue to develop on that um, but I wouldn't see them as being a, a visualization competitor cool. in the space. Got it. And then, and then going to Looker, um, what has anything changed there since Google acquired it? Um, yeah, I think you asked me that earlier. I was going to try and maybe some thoughts around that. So the question was, uh, after the acquisition within Tableau, did we see anything uh, change? Yeah. I guess uh, to start, it was surprising that um, after the acquisition from Google, uh, we haven't really seen much in the space moving in terms of what they've done uh, with the tool. So it seems like same same as before. Um, Google acquire, I think, was in the region of five billion or some or something along along those numbers. Um, so that's a surprising part on on the Looker side. However, on the on the Tableau side, what I've seen is that there's a a big effort to integrate some of the technology like Einstein, which is their uh, predictive and uh, AI models from Snowflake within Tableau. Tableau continues to innovate and work closely with Salesforce. I think Mark Benioff quoted, um, was quoted last month on their 
lightning score to say that Tableau is going to be proven the best uh, software purchase um, yeah. that they've made. So that it, I think it's interesting the way that both companies have chosen to um, to take their purchase. So I think Salesforce was a lot more uh, keen in seeing that integration between the tool tools and maybe a lot of um, collaboration even within their customers. So maybe you had a customer that already had Salesforce and now benefits from using Tableau and now vice versa. Whereas maybe on the Google and Lucas space, um, I just haven't seen that happening as, as much. Right. Right, right. So so, so bringing it um, all together in a sense, how, and this is, we, we always look around the concept of economic modes, just, just the concept of a, a product or a company being uh, very, very sticky, right? In this aspect, because uh, that's what comes to mind when, when you think of like a snowflake, right? Mm -hmm. um, which is top of mind here. Um, being the data layer, how sticky is that long-term? Um, once you're using it and it, and it works, uh, we, we just think of Oracle, right? Uh, for so long being that layer and, and every customer that we've ever spoke with uh, for whatever reason, pricing or, or, or another thing is, is not necessarily that, that happy with it, but still uses it um, to this day. So how sticky is that layer? Um, and, and, and from your point of view? Um, yeah, I, th I think there's a couple of things that we can talk about. Um, I, I just haven't been, maybe on the technical side, I haven't been as close to in the, in the last maybe two, three months, but as I understand, there's a lot of things that they've been doing in the background to allow those migrations to happen. So to facilitate moving away from, uh, as you mentioned, I'm, like the old uh, giants of Oracle or maybe the SAPs of the world and things like that. So um, I think I, I, th I think that will be the proof will be there on those really large accounts. I think they have somewhere around 50 or so. 50 or some clients that are spending north of a million dollars. So it'll be interesting to see what they do with those large accounts. And I guess if you can get maybe two, three that has, have successfully migrated from large legacy, um, bulky things like Oracle into a more um, adjusted uh, tool, or in this case, uh, using Snowflake that gives them the flexibility of, you don't have to worry about having the largest software warehouse because you have, say, at the beginning of the month, you're, you need a lot more capacity because you're loading everything in, but you can be flexible in terms of storage and the fact that you can uh, license, in terms of compute and storage gets, gets priced differently. And uh, if you're not querying, you're not being charged for. So having that flexibility, I think, as soon as we see some headlines in terms of those companies making those moves, I think we will we'll probably see more of those coming along. Right. Got it. Nice. You know, I think um, I want to do one more thing is I know you, everything we talked about is, is uh, kind of uh, things you do in your for-profit world, but you do a lot of stuff in the nonprofit world and in BI as well, which is pretty cool. Share some, some stuff. So, so we know a little bit about what you're doing on that end. Right. So um, thank you for that. So I'm also part of a board, which is Viz for Social Good. And uh, yeah. what it is, Viz yeah. for Social Good. Got it. So what, what it is, is um, it's, it started as a community initiative maybe three, four years ago. Uh, and we connect with charities that maybe have data, but they don't have the skills or the, the budgets to be able to visualize data. Uh, and we connect them to some of the volunteers within the visualization community. So for instance, this month of September, we are partnering with Bridges to Prosperity. They... they build and put in place some bridges within communities. So maybe connecting uh, rural communities within Africa. So instead of having to do 200 kilometers to go around to connect two villages, the fact that they have a bridge there, they can shorten that maybe. And it's only like 20 kilometers to cross that river. So a lot of that work that they've been doing and they have the data for it. And our volunteers are visualizing the data and the impact that they had. And then, of course, they can utilize that to look at funding and other projects and kind of spread the message and kind of focus on that charity. So we do a lot of that. And we've done that with both um, organizations in Europe as well as in the U.S. as well. Um, we have somewhere around 4,000 volunteers uh, mm -hmm. throughout the year, which is, which is super exciting to see as well. Yeah, no, that's awesome. Uh, um, cool. I think, I think that's a good place to, to wrap up. Um, I'll definitely put some stuff on, on Viz for Social Good. Um, on this episode, 
Um, and, and if, I guess if anyone has any questions for you, how can they reach out to you? I know you got a LinkedIn, so maybe that's the best route. Uh, yeah, LinkedIn is, is, it will probably be the best. Or if you want to get involved with Viz for Social Good, it is vizforsocialgood.com. Uh, and you have all the information in there. Cool. That's it. Let's wrap up, David. I appreciate coming on here and telling us everything about uh, everything you know and uh, keep up, Boz. Obviously, the the great stuff you do at at, at yeah, your company and, um, and and yeah, we'll be in we'll be in touch and hopefully tomorrow we'll see uh, the Snowflake IPO and see some of the success that uh, hopefully they have over the next uh, decade or so. That's great. Thank you very much. I appreciate cool. the time. Thanks, David. Have a good one.